morning, World Palm Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning with you. Good morning. I, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Jonathan Jones, one of the pastors here at Royal Palm, um, alongside with Claudia, our pianist, and Dr. Robas at the organ. Um, greetings to those of you who are online. Thank you to Chris Kent and Kathy Myron for making that broadcast possible. If you're out there, uh, and looking for a church, we're located at Jog and Hypoluxo, and we gather each Sunday at 10 a.m. Of course, uh, normally Dr. Joe would be uh, my sidekick here, but uh, Chiki and Betsy are away, um, and so you're here, and it's, it's good to be here. We're, we're gathered in the house of the Lord because he's blessed us with, with so much to be thankful for, and he's shown us show, so much mercy. But above all, we're gathered to exalt him, for he's worthy of all of our worship. So I draw your attention to the call to worship that you can find in your bulletin there. I'll read the light text and you can respond with the bolded. The Most High is a dwelling place, abide under the Almighty's shadow. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. No evil shall befall you. Thousands may fall at my side, but it shall not come near me. He will give His angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. He will answer when I call, so I shall trample the serpent underfoot. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our first hymn is a fitting response to that call, number 686, a reminder that the same God who helped our fathers is a very present help when we call upon him now. 686, O oh God, our help in ages past. Church, 
we've been learning uh, not only to read them and to pray them, but to sing them to our God, since this is the best way to hide, hide his word in our heart, which is why he commands us for not only his praise, but for our good. Now remember, I've said in the past that in the Psalms, when you sing them, there's going to be lines that may make you uncomfortable with how uh, with their their language. But remember, when you feel that way, that it's not us that conform the Bible to our own image, but rather the Word of God that transforms us into the image of Jesus. Amen. And so, to help. The medicine go down, so to speak. I've added a spoonful of sugar, choosing a setting of Psalm 3, which you can find in the insert there, that's set to the tune of Amazing Grace. It matches the message actually quite well for the salvation of the Lord is by grace alone. Let's sing it together, Psalm 3. Jesus is a vast ocean underneath us, carrying us onward to the shores of glory amidst whatever trials and temptations may come. 352, oh the deep, deep love of Jesus.
we have assembled this morning to praise you, for you are great, a God over all gods. You rule over all the nations with justice. Let all the peoples be glad and sing to you for joy, O King of creation. Though you are high and exalted above the heavens, you do not forsake even the least of your creatures, but feed the poor and show mercy to the broken. A generation not born will recount your mighty deeds and declare your righteousness to their children. There is no God like you, holy in all your perfections, and yet every moment of time in every corner of the world is in the palm of your tender hand. Dear Father, we thank you that we can speak to you because of Jesus, your Son, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us with words too wonderful. We are glad that you reward our patience with grace. Thank you that you have shown us your ways and not left us to wander aimlessly. Even your discipline is gentle. You correct us so that we are restored. When we're in trouble, you are near to rescue us, and even when we fall into sin, you do not forsake. Because you've drawn near to us with your mercy, Lord, we confess to you now our sins. We have broken your law and put other gods before you, preferring to satisfy our own curiosities instead of enjoying you. We covet our neighbor's possessions, their status, even their spouses and lifestyles, instead of taking grateful pleasure in what you've given. We have held grudges, stewed in our anger, and given ourselves to the intoxication of bitter envy instead of showing mercy as been shown to us. We've turned our eyes from your word and kept our lips silent from prayer. Our hearts have truly been far from you at times and grown cold to, toward those who are in need. Father, forgive us for Jesus' sake. Show us the compassion because we are hidden in the wounds of Jesus. Holy Spirit, restore our peace of conscience that we might glorify the name of the Lord. Now intercede for us as we offer these, our petitions. There are many troubles these days because men act without knowledge and disregard the principles of your word. Please restrain the spirit of evil and strife that so pervades our society. Give courage to those who are charged with defending the innocent and helpless, that they would act with justice. Grant heavenly wisdom, humility, and integrity to our leaders. Fill those missionaries and saints boldly taking the gospel where their lives are at risk with perseverance. Protect and prosper them. For those who are sick, we ask that you would strengthen and heal them. For those lonely or weak, draw near to be their comfort. For Royal Palm Church, we ask that you would bless us to be fruitful and multiply your kingdom. Refresh the spirit of our pastor as he is away, and bless the reading and hearing and preaching of your word this morning. Open our hearts to hear it. For we ask it in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have a time of greeting. Look for someone who maybe is, is new or you haven't noticed before and greet them in the name of Jesus. Please stand and greet them.
spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about five thousand. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no man, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could not say anything against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they confirmed among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them, because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over forty years old, on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. We have just a few announcements this morning. In fact, we have uh, an anniversary to recognize, and I think it is fitting that we, we sing to them uh, today. We'll sing to the tune of Happy Birthday, as we often do here at the church. Lori and Paul Hamer. <laughs> breakfast at 8.30 across the uh, Warner Hall. Uh, we're going to be reading uh, the book Principles of War, and this is chapter 6 on the element of surprise. Um, each week on Wednesday, we've been gathering at 10.30 also in, in Warner Hall across the way to complete our study of the Holy Spirit, uh, which is presented by Sinclair Ferguson. It's been a wonderful edification to us here, um, and so there's just a few of those lessons left, and we, we uh, encourage you all to, to come on out to that Wednesday, 10.30, um, study on the Holy Spirit. Now, as we try to move our way back towards normalcy here, we're, we're hoping to be able to pass out the plates uh, at, at, with, um, with the offering, and so we do need some ushers for that. So please, um, if you're willing to, to usher, we ask that you would um, let us know. Next week, we're celebrating 
communion on July 4th. Of course, it's the, the birthday of our nation, and we'll be celebrating that as, as well. Um, but we ask that you prepare yourself to uh, receive the Lord's Supper, and what a wonderful celebration that will be. Mm. Now, as I said, we, we don't yet pass up the plates. We have a box in the back there, and if you're watching online, you can give. There's a Donate Now button. Um, if you want to give your tithes and offering there, but in lieu of that, we'll have a musical offering. I hope that it will bless you to you. Doxology. Show us more about Jesus even now, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, if you've ever walked into a movie uh, and missed the first few minutes of it, I just hate that. Uh, you feel totally lost. Because with, with any good film, the beginning is the essence of the whole. There's usually some kind of flashback scene or a flash-forward scene that, that really captures the, the essence of the movie. It's just like an acorn that has all of the DNA of the great mighty oak that would be developed. And so it is with any good book. 
And the Psalter is no exception to that. So uh, to those of you who missed Psalms 1 and 2, I, I'm sorry. If you've walked in after the opening scene here, I'll try to catch you up to speed. So the, the Psalms are uh, a book that were composed by many different authors over many generations and years with various topics and points. But if you study them carefully, it's obvious that someone took the time to collect and arrange them, these 150 psalms. Now, many commentators miss this idea, but the psalms are not a shoebox filled with random songs just tossed in, but rather an ordered and bound book. The best proof of that, as you can see, even at the, at the page there, if you turn to the Psalms, page 368 in your, your pew Bible, there's, it says book one, there are five books within the book of Psalms. And so that's by design intended to reflect the five books of Moses. So these are meant for our instruction. And so you might wonder, well, who shaped the Psalter? Well, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's likely someone like the priest, Ezra, who was leading the people back uh, from exile along with Nehemiah, their governor. And he endured great persecution as he did so, and they attempted to rebuild the kingdom there, the, the walls of the city of Jerusalem and the temple itself, and to reestablish the worship of God. All along the way, he's dealing with the unbelief of the people, but teaching them how to worship while awaiting the coming Messiah. And I would say that there is quite a bit of similarity between his situation, their situation, and our own even this day, which is why the Psalms have always been a book that is dear to the church. You look at those pocket New Testaments, there's almost always a book of Psalms attached to it. So if the, the book of Psalms was shaped and bound as, as one book, what is the shape of this book? What is the order of it? Well, it's not thematic or chronological. We see that it jumps around from time to time. But there is a story behind it. There's a narrative backdrop. Ezra used, as I, as I suppose, used the Psalms 1 and 2, which for the Hebrews really just one song, to introduce all the themes, to introduce, that's that flash forward, as it were, all the purpose of the Psalms. And so I'll try to encapsulate that for you here. The idea is that God spoke all things into existence by his word. So all those who delight in his life-giving law bow the knee to God, who is the king, and we are blessed. But look, we look around, there is, are foolish kings and nations raging against him. They conspire against his people to depose the king and to cast off his law as though it doesn't have any binding. But the good news, and we see this in Psalm 2, is that the nations are an inheritance to him. The wicked will be dashed, but all those who are wise bow to the sun, they kiss the sun, and rejoice. And so the proper narrative begins here with Psalm 3. Let's read it together. This is the word of God. A Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom his son. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. This is the word of God. Well, psalm 3 is often known as the morning psalm. It teaches us 
how to start our day. Here, the Psalter begins in that uh, narrative uh, theory of in media res, a Latin phrase that means thrust right into the middle of the action. So here, the Psalter uh, gives us an example of David, of how to be godly in dealing with crisis. Hmm. It's a shortened psalm, you can see, uh, because it is meant for the psalm for those who are in a uh, time of trial, so it's no time to search for refined language then. A testimony of God's grace who found peace on this morning. Now, if you look at the title of the psalm there, the psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son, uh, many people ignore those titles. Not the, not the bolded print, if you look at that pew Bible, that is added by a, an editor later, but the, the print that is along with the text. Now, it's unknown who added these, but as I said, likely someone like Ezra. And the church has always considered those words as part of scripture. They're not extra to it. In fact, if you were to go to a synagogue, the Jews would still chant these words as singing the song today. The, the background here of the psalm shows that this is not just any old morning uh, that this prayer is offered, but a very specific one. But recorded here with general effects so that we could use this language as our own, as God's people. It conjures that familiar story, you know it, when Absalom had conspired to capture the kingdom so that we can relate. Now, after conniving in Jerusalem for a while, Absalom, we know, went on to Hebron and he was there anointed by the people as a rival king. So the news came to Jerusalem that people were flocking to Absalom. So we see David not only dethroned, but forsaken by almost all men. David knew he was in danger, for he was completely unprepared. So he did what he had to do without waiting. He took those who were loyal to him and fled out of the city. Down that steep descent out of Jerusalem, across the brook Kidron, into the desert. And as he went, you can picture the scene now if you remember it, there's Shimei on the hill and He's shouting curses at David and saying, God won't deliver him. He's calculating there, Shimei, that Absalom, who would raise an army against David, proved that God was no longer on his side. We all know people like that. They might say, ah, you're religious. Where is your God to help you now? And what we find is that this was a bitter day of sorrow for David under the conspiracy, and, and perhaps even worse, for David knew that this was all brought upon himself by his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. Mm. The psalm itself can be divided into four easy stanzas. You see it broken in the, in the text there before you. And it's not a continuous description like a, a narrative or a story, but as poetry will often do, if you have a series of snapshots, pictures, images that were chosen carefully to uh, meditate upon that the reader would remember. So in verses 1 and 2, we see how to complain. Now you might think, well, I know lots of people that are really good at complaining. How could it possibly be that we need any help? in how to complain. Well, maybe we'll use the more pious word of lament, right? It teaches us how to lament. And, and that lamenting, in fact, is a necessary and good part of the righteous life. Um, and you notice the, the audience of that lament. David, who's pressed down with utter despair of relief from every earthly quarter, directs his complaint to God concerning his enemies. We note that the psalms of praise are quite outnumbered by the psalms of lament and complaint throughout the Psalter. So why is that? How does that teach us how to live? Well, first I'll note that the psalms of lament, just like this one here, they move from that lament on to praise, just as the book in general, you know, the book of Psalms ends with great praising. Uh, and so praise is our goal, even in the midst of crisis. 
But I say, if you look at the worldview of the church today, maybe especially in America, we are wealthy, educated, right? blessed in so many earthly ways, and yet so many of us are deeply disappointed. Mm. Should it be so? I don't think so, and neither do the Psalms. Psalm 1 teaches us that if we dwell on God's word, we meditate upon his law, then we are blessed. We should be happy. There are so many different ways in our culture today that people identify themselves. You can hardly even keep up. I say we should identify <laughs> as happy, for our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, the church today not only in general neglects the Psalter in, in its use, but it neglects especially the Psalms of Lament. Why is that? Why do we neglect these Psalms? I think because we believe that faith doesn't acknowledge negativity. But that's not really the way it ought to be. For forsaking the Psalms of Lament is done at an extreme cost. For many of us then fall into a kind of hypocrisy, pretending that life is rosy, mm. passively accepting whatever it is that comes our way, and we call that good. But the Psalter teaches us to make keen observation of the problems of life, and then to take initiative to talk to God about them. See, praying and singing psalms of lament teach us that God is not okay with simply the status quo. And it teaches us that we can actually address him, maybe in risky ways, knowing that God is a reforming God. Psalm 3 immediately throws us into the realities of life, that things are not always all right. But by faith, we recognize evil while looking for angels in the architecture. The good news is that God is present in the depths of life and that he hears our cries even there. The Psalms of Lament give us language to express the complaint to God. That's how they teach us how to lament properly. And so in Psalm 3, we have an illustration of the mess that we regularly find ourselves in. And it comforts us whose lives are really not perfectly manicured, if we're honest with ourselves. We are reminded that blessedness can even come in such a mess. That the path of the righteous is not a detour around the problems of life, but really walked with Christ right through the valley. And the first word, Lord teaches us how to be faithful, not to pretend everything's okay, but to present these problems to God. And then we know that we, when we stand in the darkness, we don't stand alone. We can pray, joining the communion of the saints, affirming the resurrection of Jesus, who burst out of the depths of despair and conquered them. David here exclaims to the Lord in amazement of his reality. The, the book of Samuel says it like this, that the conspiracy was strong with Absalom, for the forces continued to increase with Absalom while those forces with David were diminishing. It was not only his son who had betrayed him, but even his faithful counselors, Ahithophel and others. Many say of David and even some of his friends thought that God was done with him. He had been forsaken. So it is that trouble comes in flocks. Sorrow will often bring its big family. No jokes about the Joneses there. <laughs> there comes trouble. Okay, maybe sometimes there is a little trouble. In the room. You might say that, well, David had thousands of enemies here. I, I simply can't relate to that. Well, I ask, how many enemies do you need to make your life miserable? <laughs> Only one good one if they're talented and perhaps vicious. And you're lucky in life if you know who those enemies are. Mm -hmm. Now, you might not be able to say that, well, my son has raised an army against me. However, we probably all have some family that hate us or perhaps have betrayed or, or out to get you in some way, or, or some person in your life that we have that experience with. So Psalm 2 concludes with that 
great lie against the righteous. There is no help for you in God. This is the worst kind of despair, to fear that there is no help in God. No greater vexation to the child of God. It puts us to a decision. Do we believe that lie, or do we trust in God? Well, how did David handle it? That's, that's what we, we look at here in, uh, in Psalm 3, verses 3 and 4. David shows us how to deal with crisis. Before we get there, I want to say that if you look between the stands, there's this puzzling word, silah. Scholars don't often know what this means. It occurs 73 times throughout the book of Psalms and a few times in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, the Septuagint uses a word that indicates there's some kind of musical modulation that's supposed to happen here at this point. It could mean that there's supposed to be an instrumental interlude of, of sorts. Some say that it's a mark of affirmation, like an amen right there. Calvin said that it meant to lift up, as it were, that is to lift up your voice and sing. But it's probably most likely, I think, that the word means simply to pause mm. and to think about what has been sung. Notice the change in tone from the first and second verses to the third and fourth. David goes from crisis to quiet confidence. Well, what has happened in this time? Well, what happened was David, who had his eyes fixed on his enemies who were increased, and after pausing to think, now he has laid his eyes upward to God. It's always that way, isn't it, when we look at our danger, that the danger itself seems to grow in our minds. But once we get our eyes off that danger and onto the Lord, then the dangers diminish. Now, does the danger vanish? No. It's real danger here. This is why David describes it as such. Does danger reduce? Not usually in our experience. The danger is probably every bit as strong after as it was before, but now you see it through the proper perspective. In light of God and, and seeing him, everything fades into its right significance. Mm. A great analogy of that, you think of the spies who went to spy out the land, those 12 who were sent, and they see the sons of Anak, those great towering giants. But only Caleb and Joshua looked to God. And when they did so, they found that the giants shrunk to manageable size. Even the 10,000 marching with Absalom, here in David's eyes, become manageable. Psalms, this, this psalm does not reference David's sin that brought about this trouble. You might ask, why is that so? Why doesn't it deal with it? Well, the truth is because we know from the book of Samuel, David had already confessed it. It was repented of. And so David, he only deals with the present situation. He, uh, he knows that he is forgiven. And so we shouldn't doubt God's forgiveness if we've truly repented. We should not confuse the voice of the Holy Spirit, who convicts us, and the voice of the devil, who accuses us. Hmm. Sometimes they might sound similar in our mind, but if we listen carefully, there's a big difference. Hmm. Instead, we ought to rely humbly upon God's mercy and seek his face in the face of evil, especially when that evil opposes not just you, but it opposes God as well. For we know in those circumstances that God keeps his promises to those he loves. Now maybe this morning you find yourself believing the lie of verse 2, there is no help for you in God. What could God do? He doesn't seem to care about me. My hope is lost. I am a lost cause. Well, pause. I want you to recall this morning the whole world surrounding that man dying on the tree. Mm. There were legions of enemies, armies of fiends, the crowds of bodily anguish and spiritual sorrow that faced our Savior, death and hell allied against him. And he hung there for you. Now, if that's not enough, I don't know what else you need to assure you that he is for you. 
Well, I'll tell you another. Well, he even routed those enemies. The, there, the dragon lost his stinger when he thrust it into the soul of our Savior, Jesus. So what does this teach us? It teaches us the design of the blasphemies of the enemy. You see, they're intended to intimidate. They're intended to overwhelm us. And that's what they were trying to do with David here, so that he would not even bring the fight. You see, they were not wanting a fight. They wanted to have the fight over before it started. And the same is true today. The roar of the lion that he gives. David was not silenced. He showed his faith here. God heard him in his cries. And so we're taught to not withhold our groanings from God. Don't become sullen in distress, but pray. Perhaps even out loud, as David said, I cried out with my voice and bring complaint to God. David shows us, David shows us how to pray here by first stopping to get your eyes off of your enemies and instead uh, on to God and to praise him. You're to give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do it when crises face your life. Perhaps, maybe they'll even face you tomorrow morning. And if you do, you'll be able to say with David, my God is a shield around me. Amen. And when David looks up to God, what is it that he sees? He sees that, as I said, God is a shield to protect him. The word for shield here is the one that is a shield that surrounds. It's round about. It surrounds him entirely above and beneath, like the, like the hymn we sung about Jesus' love. Within and without, God woods off the fiery darts of the devil from beneath us. He fights off the storms that are brewing above us and speaks peace within our heart. He'll lift your head, as David says here. Perhaps this morning your head is drooping, maybe despairing about something or depressed. Well, God will answer your cry and he will hear you from his holy hill. In scripture, the word for hear is the word to answer. We know that God always answers prayer. He doesn't always do so immediately. And he doesn't always do so the way that we want him to, but he does always answer, for his ways are higher than our ways. If you live long enough with the Lord, you know that it's true and that it should be in your minds from day to day. So pray expecting God to come with an answer. And I recommend that you make a record of his answer to you so that in your memory of his deliverance, it will give you strength in days to come. You say, he was with me in the past, and so he will be with me again. Right. When that happens, your problems begin to shrink. In verses 5 and 6, we see a wonderful godly example of courage in the morning. Verse 5 is where we get the word uh, for the morning psalm. That's why it's called as such. Now David was out there in the wilderness. He didn't even know what was going to happen next. He had heard that Absalom's armies were marching to Jerusalem, and he's not sure will Absalom wipe him out. Now, under such circumstances, perhaps anyone would be on watch throughout the night for some creeping enemy to come, wouldn't you? But David slept as his enemies surrounded him. It's remarkable. How could he sleep on a night like that? He didn't underestimate his enemies, no, but he trembled not. David thought of God, who had answered before. Now, as I said, he's in the wilderness. David is not in his safety of his stately palace there. He's in the open field under the canopy of heaven. He had a soft pillow, the peace of the gospel that makes us to forget the dangers that come. And such sleep is the kind of sleep that is needed to cheer us and to embolden us for the conflicts of the day. Now, David didn't sleep soundly as the wicked do, drunk in foolish pride, ignorant of God's wrath, but in the full knowledge of God's protection. This is not to say that David had no anxiety whatsoever. Surely there was, but in his anxieties, he rested in God and he conquered his fears. How do you sleep at night? 
guilty maybe, or anxious, perhaps sadness keeps you awake at night, keeps me awake at night, is wondering where the sun has gone. Then it dawns on me. Uh, <laughs> not, not. <laughs> David slept soundly, we know. So you can too, if you commit your life to God. And this is remarkable, but this psalm is not the psalm of the, the evening, that's Psalm 4, in fact. But this psalm is the psalm of the next morning. See, David woke up and he's refreshed at what is coming. What is coming? It's an army. He's not afraid because he's resting in the Lord. Don't be confused here. Many think that after David made his prayer, there was really no battle to come, but that's not the case. In fact, a real battle does come. He describes it in the last stanza of the psalm. But the key to courage is this, that he was able to see his future glory even in the midst of his present shame when all had abandoned him. And maybe even more, he was able, and as we should, see our present glory in the sufferings that we face. For in them we have fellowship with our Savior Jesus. Mm. We often miss this glory because we are so desperate in life to sidestep whatever earthly shame would come our way. But I say we should live boldly as those three men who were about to be cast into the furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, even if the Lord does not rescue, we will not bow down. It reminds me of the story of Martin Luther when he was journeying toward the, the city of Worms uh, just a few days before he was to die. And there was a messenger sent by a close friend to him saying, Do not enter that city, for there are as many uh, enemies as there are tiles on the roof. And so Luther replied, Go and tell your master that even if there would be that many devils as tiles on the housetops, I still would enter it. The messenger returned, and Luther said, I am undaunted, and I fear nothing great pastor of uh, Britain, Charles Spurgeon, once said, So we should trust not when it is reasonable to do so, when appearances are favorable, to sail for the kingdom when the wind and the tide are with, it, with us, believing only when we see, but rather let us follow the example of David and unreservedly say, I will not be afraid of ten thousand. Let's not measure God's assistance according to man's measure, but despise whatever terrors stand in our way when God is on our side. This is the triumph of faith when we're surrounded by enemies. Now, we'll notice that David does not simply, after this, rashly go into battle. No, he begins with a prayer in verse 7 and following. This is the testimony of God's salvation. David had described the crisis and expressed his confidence in God and demonstrated his courage, but now even still he cries out to God for help because he knows that he is in desperate need of it. David calls upon God to rise up as though God were in a slumber. We too should call upon God this way to rouse him, not because God sleeps truly, but because he wants us to call on him as if he does. It's possible that the Psalms simply recall uh, the, the former victories that David had in the past when, when he, uh, he says, Arise, O Lord, and save me. But I agree with John Calvin who, who says this verses 7 and 8 actually reveal the very answer to his plea that he was making. For David follows it with thanksgiving for his deliverance. And notice in the end how David thanks him for the salvation upon the whole nation. The whole nation was saved from this insurrection. And he credits God with that salvation who gives safety and blessing to his church. For the gates of hell will not prevail. Now either way you take it, we know the story. David was rewarded for his faith and courage. But he states very plainly that salvation belongs to the Lord. And this here we see the clear teaching, the doctrine that salvation in Christ is by grace alone. 
You've heard before that God helps those who help themselves. David says the exact opposite here. David says the exact opposite. God helps those who cannot help themselves. It's the exact opposite. Absalom had all the numbers. Everything was on his side. But David, just a few little uh, numbers of loyalists. And so it's true that if God did not help David, there was no help coming. The battle did eventually come, and 20,000 were killed, among them Absalom. God delivered, and God received the glory for it. Now, we need deliverance in all kinds of ways in our lives, but above all, we need deliverance spiritually. There is no help for man apart from God. Salvation is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made you alive when you were dead in your trespasses, helpless. And so the cross and the empty tomb are the proof, above all proof, that salvation is in God alone. And it's in that light that it makes sense what David says about his enemies. He compares them to wild beasts who had, whose teeth can no longer pierce him. They cannot devour him. So rejoice, O believer, thou hast to do with a dragon whose jaw is broken, whose head has been dashed and teeth have been removed. The devil prowls as a toothless lion because his head has been stopped. So, if in the salvation of your soul, though, that God took no other recourse but helped you, in that you were utterly helpless, subject to the power of the devil, on your way to hell, if he intervened even then, how much more will he intervene when you cry out for salvation in the battles of daily life? You see, solving the crises of life are not simply up to you. God wants to work through you. He wants to honor his promises. So say, arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. He loves to demonstrate his power in and through you. Let's pray. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you hear us when we cry. We, we thank you that when we stumble and fall, you're there to pick us up. We thank you that you're merciful. We thank you that you are on our side and that we can cry out to you for you hear us. Save us, O oh God. Deliver us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We have a closing hymn from number 526. This is The Solid Rock. Let's sing it together.
that our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessing because he lives.